I always get the first wave. Pretty much, I it brought me to tears, like the wave was so good. That's the biggest drop I've ever taken in my life. And so right there, I told myself I needed to just relax and stay calm, that I'm stronger than this. Well, hey, Buzz, thanks, mate. I've um, I, I seen you around uh, all the time, and I've been wanting to get you on, and uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure because, uh, you know, as, a, as for me growing up, when I was really being influenced by where I wanted to take my career or what I wanted to do is right when you guys, you know, you and Kalama and uh, Double D and Laird and etc. etc. Et you know, I guess basically the strap crew, you know, was sort of like just coming in strong and I was lifeguarding and, you know, I was, I was doing my surf life saving stuff and surfing and I just bought a jet ski and you know, I must have watched all those DVDs a million times, you know, and you guys really inspired me to uh, to get to Hawaii. Well, I was coming to Hawaii, but, like, just to spend the time here and just, I mean, I was obsessed with all that stuff and wanting to tow Jaws and that. So, first off, thank you. Thank you for being one of those guys that really, um, I mean, really, I mean, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have brought a house in Hawaii and be living here full time and have a family if it wasn't for you guys i don't think it's crazy but so you're welcome i'm glad i'm glad it influenced people like you to come here and enjoy it yeah it's uh it's been amazing what a ride i mean i mean we've been friends for a pretty long time and you know i know i know your, your sons and we have a pretty good um relationship but i'd like to take try and take it back all the way to the start and i did a little research and i never knew that but you were you were born in um in, in Indianapolis, is that right? Yeah, Indiana. Indianapolis. Yeah, that's crazy. Near the five hundred racetrack, Indy five hundred. Yeah, yeah. So pa- your parents were um, ra- born and raised there, and they had you guys there. Yeah, born both born and raised in Indianapolis. And then, so what? What? What made them? It, it's it, it always blows my mind that. Some of the best surfers in the world and best like watermen, like yeah, they were born in these crazy places, and their parents just happened to go. Well, I'm going to go from Indianapolis to Hawaii. <laughs> you know, it seems like a really left field thing, but you know, was it a job opportunity or? My dad was in the Merchant Marines, and they stopped in Hawaii, and he thought the place looked really cool. And then he was back in Indiana and uh, doing his job. He was an insurance salesman, had a, a company, and raising his kids and the weather was terrible. And then a friend of his moved to Hawaii and he talked to him on the phone and his friend said, it's great, come on out. So my dad sold the house, sold his business. We loaded up in the country squire, drove across the country to San Francisco, got on the lure lane and sailed into Honolulu Harbor, 1967. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. Cause I know, I know your, your roots were, on the, uh, were in Kailua, if I'm not mistaken, when you guys first yeah. got here, right? Yeah, grew up in Kailua. Yeah, cool. And then what was what what was that like? What was Buzzy? What was Buzzy Kerwock's like? So I guess you know. So what you were ten or nine when you? I was ten. Yeah. So what was what was were you were you in the obviously in the sports and stuff? Were you just into like you know the the, the general sports in America? You know the baseball, football, playing that growing up and. I I, I never liked baseball. I played a little football. Um, I, I was kind of too small. The biggest the biggest. Uh, play on my team was fake at the curb box and give it to anybody else. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> but uh, we went to Florida from Indiana. We went to Florida and I saw a Beach Boys album cover with surfing on it. And I thought that looked really cool. It gave me uh, this little desire to uh, come to Hawaii and be a surfer. Yeah. So, so your parents moved and then was that sort of like, as soon as you guys got to Hawaii, you, you that that was it. Basically, everything else took a back seat, and you're like, I'm gonna just obviously well, you just want to surf to get better and have fun. My mom, uh, my mom and I came out first, found the house in Kailua, and I took a surf lesson in Waikiki, and I just thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I told her, okay, well, tell everybody else, come on out, we're here. And she's like, no, you got to go home and finish school. I'm like, no, tell them I don't have to finish anything. <laughs> tell them, come on out. I don't want to go back. Yeah. But we had to go back. I finished my year of school, and then uh, and then we made the, the journey here. Unreal. Yeah. And so, obviously, a, a massive impact that 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 choice right there to move to Hawaii. So, what was what was Buzzy Kerbox like as a kid growing up? At you know, when you get to Hawaii, is uh, you you obviously you know going to school and stuff. 
when does when do you really start to realize that you know obviously surfing something that we all just love and you want to do it and it's awesome but is there a moment when you like sort of meet someone or see someone go you know what i'm gonna i wouldn't mind trying to do this to to my for a living or something like that well we live in in kailua right out in front of the house there was a a little shore break so i'd fight my two older brothers for the board and get down there and i surfed every minute i could before school after school every every moment i just surfed because i loved it and then there started to be some amateur contests so i decided i'd start uh entering these contests and at first i didn't get out of my heat and you know, and then I started making to semis and then pretty soon I was making it to almost all the finals. And one of my big rivals back then was a guy from Waimanalo named Michael Ho. Hmm. And so he uh, he was uh, highly competitive, winning a lot of events and, and really a big inspiration and became a rival for me throughout my amateur and on into the professional career. Larry Bertelman was uh, one division up from us. So I usually didn't surf against Bertelman, but Bertelman was a big star and the amateur surfing was, was kind of a big deal. And there was a bunch of events here. And then I went to Huntington Beach, I think 1971 for the U.S. championships. And just it just evolved. I never really had a, a plan that I want to be a competitive surfer. It just sort of happened and went with the flow. Yeah, it did. So when you, you're doing this through high school and then you obviously, you know, you've, you've finished high school and you're either... You know, generally your parents are like, hey, you know, get a job or yeah. you go on the college. Where, 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 what did you do? So once you finished high school, you're probably, you know, you've, you've had a solid seven to eight years in Hawaii. You're probably doing well and you're surfing. So you have, where, where, what decision do you make? Do you, do you, did you go to college or what, what was the next step once you finished high school? Well, for me, there was an event in Hawaii called the Smirnoff Pro-Am. So I entered that in 1974, and the winner of the amateur, just the winner, got to surf in the pro division. So I won that. I got to surf in the pro division, and I worked my way into the semifinals at sunset, and then they called it off till the next day. Overnight, the swell came up to 25-foot Waimea, and I was in the second semifinal in bigger waves than I'd ever seen in my life. And I borrowed a board because I didn't have any really – right board for Waimea. I'd never surfed Waimea. I'd never even seen it big and paddled out and uh, got mopped by a few, tried to paddle for a little one, got cleaned up by the set, had a terrible heat. But when I came in, I was like, I'm so glad I didn't advance because I didn't want to go back out there. Yeah. Was, I, heard uh, of, I, was, I, I heard a lot of stories about that event. I, I spoke to Ross Clark Jones and he was, he said the same thing that, that, that Smirnoff event, they, they moved it to Waimea and it was just giant. And there was people that didn't even paddle out for the heats, you know, really good surfers that were just like, hey, this is out of our, out of our comfort zone, you know, and, and uh, but that's, that's, that's crazy that you won the amateur and then they got you into that event and then all of a sudden you're surfing giant Waimea. We were huddled together and Fred and every, all the competitors are watching it and this one set came up and washed all the way up into the parking lot and, the, you know, a lot of the guys, it's too big, it's too big and Fred Hemmings was like, you know, what do I have to do? Paddle out and show you guys? And it was like, oh, wow. And then I heard Ben Ipa, uh, who I had just beat in the semifinal at Sunset, say, if anyone chickens out like Kerbox, I'll take his place. And I, <laughs> okay, that's it. I've, I've you know, I, I can't like chicken out. I've got to go. So that inspired me to make sure I was going to paddle out. And as I paddled out, one of the lifeguards that was coming in, um, caught this giant wave and just got annihilated, just like pulled in and just ate it like the worst wipeout I'd ever seen as I'm paddling out. It was just like, oh my God, this is frightening. Because uh, cause before, I mean, let's talk about the quick, because the lifeguards used to, and I think um, Ross was saying this was, the, you know, obviously no jet skis or anything like that, but the, the the water safety was guys on guns in the channel, the lifeguards. Yeah, right? yeah. So that was, yeah. So, that's crazy. I mean, you think about it now and you're like, okay, everyone's so used to having jet skis run in to save you. You've got a guy paddling a gun to come save you. Like, yeah, that's... hopefully come get you. Yeah. 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 Unreal. So that, so, so, so Buzzy, uh, get, so I'm guessing you won the amateur, you got into the pro. Was that that moment where you went, hey, you know what? I can do this. Like, I, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm in the pro event now. Was that the moment where you went, I'm going to give this a shot at pro? No, because... Uh, I competed as a pro 
And so therefore I couldn't be an amateur anymore. So I couldn't compete as an amateur because I only made it to the semifinals and the pro events back then, there was no trials or anything. It was a in, invitee only and I wasn't invited. So I was in, in, in uh, competitive limbo for a year or two. And then Randy Rarick in 76 was putting together a tour to some events in South Africa. There was a professional event there, the Gunson 500. And, and uh, so I signed up to that so I could go and be in the trials and, and uh, get into the pro events. And then they, we had another stop in Brazil. And at the end of that trip, they decided, let's make this a world uh, tour event. Let's make this a world tour. And that was the start of the IPS. Randy and Fred Hemmings uh, came up with the idea to make a professional circuit. So yeah, set by 77, we realized what was going on. And then I traveled the world on the, on the beginnings of the pro tour. How, how do you, how do you get to, I mean, at that stage, do you have sponsors? Like, how do you find yourself <laughs> to travel to those, those places? Like at that stage? Well, um, no, I didn't have any sponsors. There was, uh, I, I was trying to get sponsors from like local department stores, all this stuff, but surfing wasn't a big, a big deal back then. It, I mean, it wasn't in the news. It wasn't really considered a professional sport. So sponsors were hard to come by. So the first couple of years were sponsored by myself. And, uh, you know, my dad had a truck for his business. So I made signs, we haul anything. And I would go and do dump runs or move stuff and just try to make money as quick as I could to self-sponsor myself, get two boards and uh, put our board surfboards in a uh, cardboard box and start traveling the world. Just, I kept, you know, from each event, I'd get enough to like pay the hotel bill and maybe, you know, a couple dinners and on to the next place. So I was just scraping by for years. And then I started to get sponsors and I was the first uh, sponsored writer for a upstart company in Kailua called local motion. So mm. I got, I got wax, two t-shirts and, and a board for the year. Classic. That was a, that's, I was sponsored. So, yeah. Okay. So, because that back then you could actually uh, you could get into the events by the qualifying, like the tour started, like so. So you necessarily weren't like if you weren't on the tour, you could go to each event, and if you were good enough, you could get into a into a spot. Yeah, and then yeah. if you were, and then would you, then if you'd done, say you got into an event and done well, would that automatically get you into the next event, or you still had to keep doing the trials? Still had to keep doing the trials. And then at the end of the year, they would t then take the rankings. And if you had done done well enough in a few events to get through the trials, and then, then you would get yeah. through. Yeah. Yeah. Cr crazy. Because I, I did, you know, you were, I mean, heavily involved at the start there. I think I read that you were in the top 10 in the world in 77, 78, and maybe 80, something like that. So, and you won the World Cup of Surfing at Sunset in 78. And then I think in Australia, you won the... Surf, surf about. about in Sydney, right? Because yeah. I remember seeing that's you know I was I was born in seventy seven, so uh, <laughs> they put that into perspective. But I know the surf about back then was like like the stubbies was. I, I know that you surfed the stubbies at Burley Heads. That's right. That's yeah. where I grew up. I mean, it's so funny because pro surfing when you see the photos of the stubbies and the walkabout in Sydney, it was massive. Like yeah. Looked like tens and tens of thousands of people. Like I've seen photos on uh, of the stubbies at Burley, and you could not get a spot. Just Anywhere people the everywhere. Yeah. Was, yeah, yeah, it was very popular. So what? Um, so how long did you do the tour? Then you you know you got on to the tour. You obviously got through the trials and got yourself onto the the main stage. Then you're a pro surfer, traveling the world, getting all these sponsors. And then how long did that? How long did that last for? Well. 80, 80 was a really good year for me. And then 81, it was a sort of a transitional period. 82 on the tour, there was different events. I think it changed from IPS to AS, ASP and there was changes and some events counted. By 83, I was kind of, I had started modeling for polo. Uh, Bruce Weber, a New York fashion photographer, saw a picture of me in a surfer magazine, flew me to New York. I started a modeling career that led me into to working for Polo. So I was, I was still doing the tour and uh, flying off to do modeling shoots in between. And then by 83, I went, you know what? I'm making way more money modeling than chasing this tour around. So in 83, I, I left Michael Ho and Hans in South Africa, 
flew off to uh, Paris by myself and went, I'm going to Europe on a two week trip. And I just, I'm off the tour and I'm just gonna go cruise. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. I had that written down in my notes because I know that, I know Charlie Walker um, done some stuff with Guess and I think I've seen a bunch of, even Laird, I think had done some stuff. So, yeah, and then, yeah that's classic that Bruce, we- um, what was his name? Yeah, Bruce, Bruce Weber. Weber saw that yeah. photo. So, so I actually didn't know how, um, serious it was i didn't so it was a full-time legitimate gig i know you also you know levi's united airlines i think you did work for but you got contracted by ralph Lauren. was it and you were just or you you had a big you had an agency and you were doing stuff like for everyone well i i at first none of the agents agencies would take me uh bruce whoever gave me all these pictures i went around to the agencies i said here's my pictures i live in hawaii if you get a great job call me and they like laugh yeah it's like well if you move to new york let us know maybe we'll start sending you around so Mm. i went back and then i started getting the jobs from hawaii and then uh polo would fly me in and once i started doing polo then i got with an agency we're happy to have me then and then i started getting a lot of other work so um 19 i think 80 80 or 81 uh polo contracted me just exclusive uh for them and I had to work 14 days a year. So we'd go on a few trips, but it wasn't a full time. So I was making good money and that allowed me to travel the world and surf without chasing the contests around. And yeah. it also afforded me to buy a Zodiac boat so we could start go playing in the surf. Without, yeah, without so- my modeling, I wouldn't have the money to buy a boat and risk a you know, $8,000 yeah, boat out in the surf. What a, what a, great, what a great job. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I look back at you know, I look back at when I was a kid too, you know, and, and it's tough to, you got, you, you, oh, to me, it seems like you guys really thought outside the box and weren't scared to take chances or, or ch- like, cause I remember, you know, I had opportunities to do some of that stuff too, but I was too scared. I was like, oh, you know, what are my <laughs> friends going to think? And blah, blah, blah. And my mom's like, Jamie, stop being an idiot. You know what I mean? Like, and, yeah. but I feel like, it's, especially now in this day and age, like you, you have to be so diverse um, to, to make money. You know, if you want to travel the world, surf and, Yep. you're not on the tour or, or whatever it may be like you need some sort of um other self funding to do that so what what perfect timing for you and and, yeah. and we all know modeling make you know you can make some really good money from that so so let, let's transition into that you so you you finish your professional career you're making some good money from modeling and then did you like in that moment like as a kid growing up to the smirnoff did you have an inkling of like big wave like being a big wave guy or liking that uh big wave stuff or did you have to like really push yourself and get yourself out of the comfort zone to to do that because i'll be interested in like all of a sudden you've got a zodiac to go toe there's got to be some sort of transition into that obviously hanging out with like lair like like this lair and double d and stuff so yeah so what let's talk about that because this is super pivotal like to everything big wave that we have now this is a the most pivotal maybe moment in the history of big wave surfing so so let's 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 go through that well i was never a big wave guy never a fan of waimea when waimea got good i would uh jump on a plane and go to maui and surf honolua bay it'd be you know a quarter of the size but really performance surfing so when we started towing for me especially it was more about getting away from the crowds getting on the outer reefs and riding these waves that no one else was utilizing. And we, Double D and Laird and I had been windsurfing a lot too at Backyards. Double D lived right there at Backyards. So we windsurfed and we realized how good these waves were out there. And it's like, well, let's let's get my Zodiac and go out and see if we can tow onto these waves. And my intent was never, oh, we're gonna ride, you know, bigger and bigger waves. It was just to get out there and ride these beautiful waves that you could perform on and, they just happen to keep getting bigger and bigger. So yeah. double, double D was, you know, a Waimea specialist that, that had ridden giant Waimea and Laird's fearless in all, all kinds of surf always. So they, they wanted bigger and bigger surf. But for me, it was never about, oh, I'm, you know, just a fearless guy. I just want the biggest wave you can, I can ever find. I just, I just wanted high performance on bigger waves with no people around. And that was, that was the allure for me. Yeah. At that, that, so that stage, you guys are all on the uh, all living on Oahu and North Shore, like Double D for sure. But 
this stage, lads, you guys aren't on Maui at. at no, we hadn't up, gone to Ma- we hadn't gone to Maui. We went to Maui later. Later, yeah. yeah. Because what a what a great combination. Because I know Double, Double D is such a such a well, he's such an intense dude. But like for to have someone at the start of something like that being the lifeguard, and all you know to have him um, be there along the way, and obviously you know Laird's Laird. But um, take us through that moment of like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna buy a Zodiac and we're gonna we're gonna do this. <laughs> How did that come about? Well, I already had the Zodiac, and I'd been playing around with freeboarding, always freeboarding Kailu on these flat days. And, mm. and so I, uh, I talked to Laird and said, let's take it out to North Shore and, te- and you know, see how it works in the, in the bigger surf. So one day was, was pretty big. Well, the first day we went out in the Zodiac and realized that the 40 horse wasn't enough to outrun the bigger waves. So then we had to get a 60 horse Mercury and replace that motor. Then there was a, a big day at backyards, and, and uh, Double D was on at the lifeguard tower. So Laird and I went out and had this tow session. We thought, okay, we got Double D's got eyes on us. Anything goes wrong, we're covered. We had this great session. We come in, we go to the tower. Double D, what'd you think? He goes, what? I didn't even see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Without binos, we were so far out and up on the corner, you didn't even see it. Wow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we were. If the waves were big, they weren't giant yet, you know, and we were towing backyards and phantoms. And then I think it was uh, probably 92, 93, I can't, can't remember, but there was a really big northeast swell. And we couldn't get out at yards. The channel was closed. It was just a big frothy mess out there. So we went to, took the Zodiac, went to Haleiwa launch, and we're driving up the coast. And we're outside of Laniakea and Double D goes stop right here and Laird, Laird was driving the boat at that point we stop we're out in the deep blue we don't see anything we sit there for five minutes we're like double double d what what he goes just wait and we're like for what and then Laird's get antsy he starts to drive in all of a sudden this 25 foot set came in that just peeled perfect you know just absolute perfection light offshore wind out went the rope Laird went first we towed into these bigger than uh, you know, waves than I'd ever surfed. Yeah. And Derek went next, and then I got my first wave, and they towed me in. I was riding Laird's ball support, and they towed me in from deep on this big one. I'm deep. I got this board. I think I can make this. And I saw the wall, and I commit. There's that point, pull out or commit. And I committed yeah. and started going. I went, I'm not going to make this one. Uh-oh. So I just had to straighten out, and the white water just surrounded me but I was still going, surrounded me, uh, and then it just like something grabbed me by the back of the shirt and just ripped me down and just ragged all beatings. I came up, just couldn't wait to get a breath of air and Derek <laughs> and Laird pull up kind of smirking like, how was that one? <laughs> I go, uh, it was, uh, <laughs> I go, give me another one. So they, I just got right back on the horse and they went and towed me on to another one, which is, uh, one of my first completed really big wave rides. And uh, that was, from then on, we knew that we were really onto something. So just then, that big outside lining of Kaya, yeah, just yeah. firing, yeah, yeah. insane. And, and then, and so then we thought, well, let's, t- uh, let's and then uh, Laird was working on End the Summer too, and he, they had a wave runner, and at the end he, he told them that, you know, for my pay, I wanna keep the wave runner. So we got the wave runner and started towing with that and realized how much better that was than towing with the Zodiac. So we'd have the boat with the boards and everything, and then we'd have a ski that, that did the towing. So then on a Kona storm day, Double D dropped off Laird, Mike Waltz and I, and, and from Hawaii Kai, we took the Zodiac and the, and the wave runner because we were too poor to pay for shipping, didn't have trailers for them. We just throw the Zodiac in the back of the truck and we drove them to Maui and then the, our windsurfing guys, Kalama, the strap crew, uh, those guys had been windsurfing at this spot. We told them about our tow technique, and they said that might be perfect for this wave that we've been windsurfing. So yeah. we put, you know, we kind of merged and became uh, the the team and and started towing in and and discovered Jaws. So when I started, I had no idea that we were gonna, you know, yeah. go to Maui and find this wave that nobody knew about right in the backyard. I had be, no idea. It just evolved. And be, ca- be careful what you wish for sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah. So we towed it one day. I, I towed Laird into some the, the first day, and we're going, wow, this place is amazing. I wonder how big it could handle. Imagine. And then 
as, it, as we got bigger and bigger swells through that winter, we went, this can handle anything. Yeah. So we realized it just, the, the setup there was amazing. It just breaks a little farther out, a little farther out as it gets bigger and bigger, but it can handle with the deep channel on the side, it, it could handle pretty much anything that Mother Nature would throw at it. Yeah. What was it like, Buzz? What was it like, you know, just starting and with the Zodiac too? I'm sure it must have been some massive trial and errors because I, I remember seeing the footage um, of you guys that day at Yards and it didn't even looked like at that stage you, you guys are just like, oh, Point, pointing that way oh you can drive in and and turn the boat and then whip in from the side you know yeah. it just must have been so amazing to like every single time you go out it's like oh we can do that that's better oh we don't need an eight foot bolster gun we can go shorter boards and then it just and the it, tow, what, what the tow ropes were too long so you did the the ski or uh, or zodiac would be in front and the rider would get stuck behind because the rope was like too long like a regular water ski rope. So we needed, and we had to realize a shorter rope and then the giant boards and we can go shorter. So Laird and Derek went to Dick Brewer and said, we're, we're towing into these waves. We want something that can handle. And so Brewer uh, shaped Laird a 7.4, 16 inch wide, fully concave bottom board. And uh, we tested that and just went, oh my God, this thing is unbelievable. So we realized that you could start riding bigger waves on a shorter board that, the, think, the thinking back then was on a on a big wave you need a big board you need all that rail you need to, you know you need to handle a big wave but then we, as we went shorter and shorter things evolved um, you know the foot straps of course quickly and then and then realizing a lot of the days at PIE were bumpy so we started weighting the boards and that would get through the bumps better and and the first real problem was. I mean, we were riding these little boards and going faster than anybody had ever surfed is that you, the tail would cavitate and lift because we had, th you know, like three fins the same size. So it would lift the tail and then you'd start to cavitate and lose control at the bottom of the waves, which is the last thing you want to do. So then the, the fins were super important. And I think Jerry and Double D and um, worked out with smaller side fins and a big center fin and got the uh, different... Uh, foils on the fins that could handle that kind of speed. So that that was a big key, getting those fins right. Yeah, I remember feel like um, future, like Jerry was working with future fins. Or Futures, something, and, yeah. And they and they all like I remember seeing Jerry's two plus one, and then yeah, and then the fins seemed to get smaller and smaller, right? Like, and you're like, how am I? It it felt like how, how, these fins aren't even going to stay in the water. How am I going to, you know? But they they yeah. got smaller. I think they were like three and three and three quarters, like front and back, some of the smallest ones. Yeah. So what was some, tell us, I want to, what was some of the uh, moments in the Zodiac? Cause I mean, Zodiac, prop, people, rope, that seems like a nightmare in the, in the white water. You know, it's not like a jet, I mean, in a jet, on a jet ski, it's bad <laughs> enough. Like, I mean, you guys must have had some pretty crazy situations in that, in the early, early stages of that. Well, I had a history of uh, uh, contact with the propeller. When I was 15, I got run over by a Boston whaler in Kailua and had 50 Ooh. stitches on my knee. So no, I'd, no. I'd already felt it, what a propeller could do to a body. So I had that in my mind. But we, Laird and I flipped the Zodiac. Laird was driving it. He flipped it at, at Revy's one day. And, um, you know, then the motor, you got to drain it and do all the stuff. But uh, that was the only time we flipped it. And we, we did, there was a time we broke down outside of backyards on like a 15 foot day the engine just conked out on the outside. We got no walkie talkie, no communication. The, and the lifeguards didn't have anything. So we just had a paddle and started like paddling <laughs> down for help. <laughs> uh, I remember Brock a little teasing us about that. He's like, oh, you guys broke down out there. You know, because Brock was, like watching what we we're doing. A lot of people were skeptical of what we were doing out there, playing, playing out in the big surf at the boat. And, yeah. And uh, he kind of laughed a good, That's at a me. good question, actually. Like, how was it? Like, how was the, you know, because you know, even today you've still got it, right? The purest, you know, paddle and you got the jet ski in tow. Yeah. And, and it's always been like that. But yeah, what, what, was it, what was it like from the other guys that maybe, you know, were paddling? It's not like you guys were just 
like nobodies that just had money and came out with a boat and started doing it. You know, you guys yeah. are all great surfers. You're everyone knows who you guys were. So I'm wondering what it was like. Were people sort of like, ah, they, this thing's never going to work. You guys, this is stupid or what was it like? I know there was some chatterings at, at backyards of uh, like, what do you guys think you are? The undroundables? It's like, what are you doing out there? You know, it's like, yeah. And, and there was a like, attitude of you know you didn't paddle on that wave so you shouldn't be on it it's cheating it's not right it's not fair but you know we we were having a ball and getting more waves in a day than most guys get in the whole season and we're like you know some guys may not like it but we sure like it yeah and I, you know i was snowboarding one day and we were getting dropped off with the with the snowmobiles and coming down this face and halfway down the face there's a guy hiking in the middle and we kind of tracked up the thing the mountain and he was like he was going to spend his whole day for that one pure run but on the on the uh, snowmobile we were getting five of those faces a day no problem i mean to me it's it's a no-brainer <laughs> i mean yeah. i like the coming down part better than the, the going uphill part and yeah. i I, ha I had a talk with uh i mean i just i love riding the waves and i had a talk with ian walsh and uh, oh no, Shane, excuse me, it was Shane Dorian was saying that his favorite part is like hunting for the wave. He likes being in the wave, he, I mean, in the lineup and hunting and jockeying the guys and going over. And, and just that initial drop was that was the, the best rush for him. For me, I, I mean, of course, I like that part. I don't like the hunting. I like the, the initial drop, but then having a wave that you can just perform on. That's that's what I, I like being on that wave and performing. That's my favorite yeah. part. Yeah, and, and I think what you guys did it from the sounds like from the start was to get away from the crowd too. And I'm yeah. guessing back then they know no one. I mean, no one even to this day goes and paddles a, a, a big wave gun at backyards when it's 15 feet. You're either you know surfing the outer reefs or you're surfing big sunset. You know, it, it, it's it's sort of like you're you're away from the crowd anyway. So you know it's not really like I mean, look, there are situations where people cross pollinate and stuff and it, and it happens in everything we do but but generally speaking it seems like at that stage back then you guys were just hey we're, we're surfing these ways we're not bothering anyone we're having a ton of fun why why would we stop yeah and you know and for the first few years and then after we got to maui for the first few seasons it was just our group you know the strap crew and and we'd go out and utilize every swell and then a few more and then a few more, and then like all of a sudden, it was a crowded lineup with everybody was getting jet skis and coming out there. You know, it's like you know how a big wave lineup. It's not the waves aren't just pumping all day long. You see the video, you mm -hmm. think it was just set after set, but there's you know sometimes 15 minutes of of sitting there waiting for the next set to arrive. So yeah. you know, at first there's there's different things. Well, I'm I'm sitting here and I've been waiting longer, but then after 15 minutes and you know, you don't know whose turn, what, and it started to get chaotic. And it didn't take long for the, the lineup at PI to, most, to be the most crowded, dangerous lineup in the world with so many uh, jet skis and guys are trying to go left from the right side and in and out and cut you off. And it, it just got absolutely crazy and dangerous as well as all, all of a sudden there was a bunch of spectator boats in the channel that sometimes would be almost in the way or, you know, you're finishing your ride and they're right there. So it, uh, it became very crazy, and that, I think that was uh, what helped lead several of the guys back to paddling. So one of the what? problems with, pa with paddling giant waves back then was you had to paddle out there with your friends. And like you were saying about the lifeguard, you gotta come help you. Well, if you, three of us paddle out and one guy catches the wave and wipes out, I mean, what are the, other, the other two are sitting out at the peak. What are you gonna do, paddle in and try to help them? I mean, it's, it's pretty hard to help each other. But yeah. with, with the skis standing by and then flotation and stuff, then guys were like, um, let's go back to paddling these waves. Yeah. And so well, I'd, like, I'd like to go back and talk about when you got, first got to Maui because, you, I mean, you get to Maui, you, you, you go over with the, the, the ski, you got the ski and that, and then who, who is it? Is it Jerry? I mean, I remember Jerry was, was it Jerry the one that comes up to you guys and goes, hey guys, I got, a, I got, a, I got something that you guys might like. It, Cause I'm sure people had seen it before. I mean, I, I don't know, know the, the real true history about it, but from what I gather I heard was it was Jerry that come to you guys and go, hey, 
with what you guys are doing, um, you guys might be interested in this, but were you saying that Kalama and all the windsurfers, they, they had already started windsurfing it? Because yeah, it Jer- a- Jerry had turned on Waltz and those guys and, and showed them the place and said, yeah. you know, look at this wave, and they windsurfed it. So J- Jerry's turning these guys on. It happened years prior to us getting there. So when we yeah. got there, it was, it was Waltz and those guys that had been windsurfing, Mark Angulo, uh, Rush, they're, they're like, hey, you know, your towing technique is going to work at this spot. So it was... They, they, they were already on to it at that point. Yeah, and, then, and, and I'm sure, like, I'm sure once their minds, once they saw how it would work, and they're like, oh, wow, we don't need a 20-foot sail. We don't need a giant board. Yeah. Uh, you know, the light bulb probably just went off and went, oh, my God, like, yes. Like, we're going we're gonna to buy a jet ski and... And then, uh, how, what was it like with the, tr- the training and stuff? That's another thing that I think that a lot of people would be interested in. Like, you know, obviously you, you get the jet ski and you've got the tow ropes and this and that, and you guys are learning by trial and error because there's no one really to, uh, to pull you aside and go, hey guys, this is how you've got to do it. You guys are just doing it by feel, by making mistakes, by messing up, by, you know, like I'm sure you sucked up tow ropes and then there's no flotation at that stage. I mean, so... I mean, what's yeah, it, all, what's all it like mistakes. going, yeah, I mean, but like as a group, like did you guys come together as a group and, and go, hey, we need to train, we need to know exactly what to do if this scenario goes down? Like was that something that was uh, um, like that you guys took seriously well, there were, at that there stage? there was a turning point with that is uh, Laird's wife, Maria, at that point, who was a Brazilian bodyboarder, came out and she didn't have much surfing experience and she wanted to ride a wave. So Kalama towed her into this, you know, you know, pretty good size one, not, not a monster one, but she got to the bottom right when you had to turn to make it. And she just went straight and she got annihilated. We were on the, on the skis. I was, I was driving the ski and I, she had a, a leash on her board and the, she'd come up, her head would come up and she's getting dragged. And I'm going, I, I can't pick her up because she's got the leash. I, you know, there's no way I can get to her. So I just kept my eyes on her after each wave. And she got like six in a row dragged all the way in. And then Laird grabbed a ski and once things kind of settled down, he came in and grabbed her. And he's like, why didn't you get her? Why didn't you get her? I, I, well, you know, what could I do? I didn't, she had the leash on. I didn't have a sled at that point. And so we realized to, to pick up and, and be safe that we had to get the, Brian Kalana came up with the sled on the back. And so we figured we all have to have a rescue sled and learn about how to pick up people. And you can't wear a leash because you're not, you're not going to pick up someone with a leash in the, yeah. in the impact zone. Plus, the, wow. the jet skis back then didn't have the power they have today. And so you get in that broken white water and you're, the impeller's like not grabbing and you're just a sitting duck in there. We'd already, uh, you know, well, I guess right wasn't around that time. We also started finding out that we could lose the jet ski pretty easy and have it go up on the rocks, which was costly. I mean, I had one ski and when that's on the rocks, it's done. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I can't even imagine those old. What were the first ones with the the wave one of threes? The, the yeah, wave one of threes. Yeah, I can't even Se- imagine seven oh seven oh ones. I think seven. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine like trying to go in and get someone. I mean, yeah. you, we've all seen the the skis today that are eighteen hundred horsepower. They get caught. You know what I mean? Yeah. I can't even imagine you guys trying to go in there on those things yeah. <laughs> and, be, and be like, Rah! like the what just mow you down so bad. Like you guys really had to have probably taken more waves on the head. Just be like, hey, I'm good. Yeah, I'm the good. guy can't get to you yet. I, yeah, so. I, I just I want to save the jet ski. I'm good. Just come get me when I when there's no waves, you know. <laughs> so, and then what about um what about flotation buzz? Like when did was there a certain moment in time? or a, a light went off in the head? Because, I mean, I've seen plenty of photos of you guys surfing big, big waves and basically just trunks and no top, like, which is crazy. Well, Laird and I had worked on a movie on the Big Island called Waterworld. And we were in the stunt crew and they gave us these little impact vests that were not like Coast Guard approved vests, but they did impact and some flotation. And uh, it was January 28th, 1998. Um, Laird, was, Laird was already in the lineup and Victor and I showed up and Laird was wearing his vest. A few guys had been wearing vests, but I was like, why would I wear a vest? You know, after, 
after a wipeout, I want to go under the next wave. I don't want to be a sitting duck on the surface. It just it seemed like a bad idea to me. But then we realized it doesn't matter if, you know, a giant wave, if you go down 10 feet or you go down four feet, you're going to pretty much the same thing. And with the vest, you come up quicker. Anyway, so January 28th and Laird's got his vest on and the waves are giant, bigger than I'd ever seen out there. And I went, I think I'm going to wear my vest today. And after that, it would be it, it became standard equipment for me. Yeah. And and, yeah. and soon after that, everyone else, too. What, what was that day like, Buzz? Because, uh, you know, I've seen that movie Condition Black and saw that way that can't, you know, obviously out a lot, you know, logs and stuff. But what compared to what you've seen recently, you know, say the last, you know, 10, 10 years out at Piahi, like what was that day like? Because that's swell, what, what it was like on the North Shore over here. I can't, I, and I've seen photo, uh, the, some video footage of that day, but you know, the angles and the, you know, there's not as many angles to get, you know, I, I just wonder like from what you've seen recently to, to that day, was it exponentially bigger that day? Is that the biggest day you've ever seen out there? Right up there with the biggest day that I've ever seen since. But I mean, there's only been a handful of uh, maybe three or four times, maybe since then it's gotten e even close to that as big or bigger, but there, I mean, it was just giant. And, uh, uh, Victor went to tow me into this one wave and I looked at it and it just had the swing arm West bowl on it. And I, he, he went over the back and, and just kept going and I didn't let go of the rope and he turned around. He thought I was gone, but I was still hanging on. I'm like, I'm not going. He's all, what happened? I go, I didn't want that one. And yeah. the guys from the cliff are going, if you got on that wave, you probably would have died because it was just the West bowl close out. I would have either had to pull in or straighten out and neither one seemed like a very good option to me at that point. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I was just glad I didn't get that one. Uh, I had a couple waves uh, or one wave that I shared with Laird and then I caught uh, another giant one, but th there were sets on the outside. I mean, I just never seen anything like it. It was just massive. And, did, uh, it, did it, did it hold its form? Like, did it hold its form? Like, uh, further out like it, it like you were saying earlier it gets it mean gets it bigger 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 but it seems like it can still hold its form it yeah, just I, held its form perfect yeah the my biggest one was kind of a north peak and so it didn't bowl up as much laird had a couple that were uh, a little more to the inside that really went more top to bottom or mine was tall but it wasn't as thick and then some of the ones that would push in the middle were super thick but i mean there was close out ones there was ones you didn't definitely didn't want uh, you just had to pick and choose and every once in a while there'd be a good one so i rode like three or four and then uh i, I watched some of the other guys mike waltz was dropping down a big one and he just he just started going back up he just he couldn't penetrate the, li the wave was lifting so much he just went back up and uh so there wasn't uh not a lot of us rode that day i can't remember who all caught waves but i i know that uh Laird had a bunch and I had probably five and that was, that was, that was a heavy day. Yeah. At the end of that, when you get back to the Harbor, you're just like, I'm glad I'm then alive. You, then, then, <laughs> then, then you got to go, then you got to get up in Kahlua. Oh, did you go to the Harbor or to the Maliko? No, we we're, we're out of Maliko and it was gnarly. It oh, was I couldn't so even gnarly. imagine. That would be so scary. We, as... That, that day they were washing all the way up under the bridge. So wow. I, I think it was Sierra or somebody was down there early in the dark and pulled on the boat ramp. Like, how big is it? And a wave just washed past them, just completely soaked the truck. I mean, <laughs> so that day we had to, in between the sets, Malika would go dry. And then we'd unload the ski and get it over in the middle. And you had to wait for the surge. And once that surge hit you, then to get going and try to get through. And because there's a lot of rain and stormy weather too, there's all kinds of crap and debris that can get in your impeller. So one of the skis got something in the impeller in there. So you you got like quarter speed and you're trying to run this. Now we got to bring that one back up on the, on the dock and then get that out and relaunch it. I mean, it was, it was crazy. One ski, uh, Michelle Laron, they got in the middle and the wave came, uh, they went to go and they went backwards up the river and got wrapped around a tree and broke their ski and that they were done. Oh it was it was heavy just yeah yeah but that's crazy we, were, we weren't thinking oh let's go from kahului it was like no game on this is where we launched from it's just that we'd never seen the harbor 
look like that. I mean, it was there was 15 foot lefts breaking into the middle. I mean, it was crazy. Just just egress and out of yeah. there was was crazy. What was some of the uh, not craziest moment like like pre flotation? Like when you guys are just learning. You know, were there some really like close moments with you with the crew that you guys had or i mean i know you guys are were all pretty super athletes and in shape and, and and really talented and stuff but were there a few moments there where you guys were like wow like that's we really just dodged a bullet with that one yeah i mean just being out there sometimes we pull up in the morning and and be in the in the channel looking at it and hear the the sound of these waves just reeling from deep you're just like oh my god i i don't know if i want any part of this it's just terrifying and then you guys get out on the on the rope and start going and re- realize you could you could do it but there was uh i i had a bad wipeout and i got beat pretty hard and then i came up and victor came in and got me on the sled and I'm like, okay, go, Victor, go. And I'm, I'm looking back. He's looking forward, trying to drive. We're in the broken white water, and there's a 20-foot white water coming that just mowed us, and it just took me off the sled and just sent me cartwheeling through liquid space. I was just, <laughs> just going. Victor hung on a little bit, and then he got ripped off. Ski went straight up the rocks. Our boards, both of our boards, up the rocks, destroyed. And we're just going. This is this is heavy, you know. It's you, when you. Pick, Make mistakes out here. You got to pay. Yard sale. Yeah, it's it's crazy. At this at this stage, how many got how many? T- is it just the you know what we, what you call the strap crew? Is it just you guys out there at this stage? Like four, five skis, six skis. In the in the early years, and then as it went on, you know there was more and more guys. I forget what by like two thousand. I can't remember two thousand two. Really, it started really getting crowded. Yeah, how, how, but, how did you guys try and keep? I mean, how do you keep that thing a secret? I mean, was it was there <laughs> at the start when you guys first get there and you're like, oh my god, like when you really see? Because I mean, I imagine you could go up there on a really windy, twelve to fifteen foot day and like say a north direction. And you're like, oh yeah, this looks fun, but like nothing extraordinary, you know what I mean? And then yeah. you go up another day and it's pure northwest and a little less wind and it's like eighteen to twenty feet and you're like holy shit, this thing is just barreling, you know what I mean? Like, so it's sort of, uh, yeah, I just wonder how long it, you guys were able to just sort of, I mean, I, I, I'm guessing obviously the, the, the moot, you know, the, when the DVDs come out, that blew it open to the whole world, but was, was there a conscious effort for you guys, like a, like a circle of trust that you couldn't open your mouth about, you know, surfing that place? No, you know, we, we didn't really... What, what happened was uh, there was a few photographers, Eric Ader and Sylvan, were shooting it from land, sometimes from the helicopter, and some pictures started coming out. But uh, the strap crew decided that they want, they want to make the money off the photos. So they bought their own cameras and stuff. And we're, we're not going to let anybody take pictures of it. We, we, we want to make the money. <clears throat> so they bought cameras and tried to control it and made their, their first production uh, Dave Nash was shooting video from the hill and they made Wake Up Call. And Wake Up Call came out really primarily to try to sell the strap crew were, you know, surfing with foot straps and wanted to sell the idea of foot straps. And, um, but the video really showed the wave and, and all of a sudden it's like, look what these guys are riding. And so the wave got a lot of attention and that generated more and more people starting to, to want to come there. Yeah, and I'm guessing with big waves, it's not like everyone wants to go, oh, let's go surf Jaws <laughs> from, you know, surfing Hokeepo to Jaws or whatever it may be. I mean, it was, it was a, I'm guessing it was a slow trickle, but, you know, once you see that wave, it's pretty damn enticing to go and see it with your own eyes and yeah. it's mesmerizing. And, you know, if you're that way inclined, it's pretty easy to partner up with someone and go, hey, let's go. Let's go surf that because you you partnered up with Archie after all that after a while, right? You and you and Archie yeah. became partners. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's I told awesome. with Victor Lopez and then Archie and uh, I, I had a couple different partners through the through the time, and uh, yeah, it's really it's really important to have a partner that you trust and have a good communication with, 
that's uh, the key out there. You don't want to just show up and go with some guy that you've never towed with because there's, you know, a lot on the line. So it was about trust and communication and practicing all the drills of pickups and which waves and signals and what, what memories, what are the, some of the best memories you take from that time, Buzz? Cause, cause I always think back and go, can you imagine, can you imagine stumbling across jaws? Like, <laughs> like it's like now, like someone goes, Hey, come with me. I've got a, I've got a spot you might want to surf and it's the best big wave in the world. I can't even imagine. It's like, you know, and I, I, what a cool time for you guys to yeah. just, and, and yeah, and also to have that, that group of innovators and people that weren't scared to, you know, like, t- like, you know, I see even Rush, you know, Rush walking around the North Shore, like guys like that that were maybe not the high profile guys, but super talented in their own right and, and really, you know, willing to, to push the envelope. Like what a cool time for you guys to, to be, to be doing that. I just, I, I think back and go, wow, that was awesome. Yeah, we, we would get together and surf it. And then after we'd all go to like breakfast at Charlie's and sit around and talk about it and share our stories and the camaraderie that we had, it was, it was great. We were having good times and good friends and that crew, we were super tight. We'd always go to dinner at somebody's house or it was a, it was a tight knit group in the water and out of the group, out, out of the water. And then, uh, you know, as time went on, things just kind of fell apart. Yeah, with I mean, all the yeah. every people got kids and moved away and different different things and, but yeah. that era that era was our, our group, all tight friends doing stuff together in and out of the water and that was uh, that was an amazing part of my life. Yeah, I, I you know I used to when, when we we can get onto that too paddling in Molokai but you know when I was training for Molokai I'd go and stay with Dave Kalama and and I would pick his brains you know too about those those times and. Yeah, I, I think that he, he was the same. He's like, they're just, no one can ever take that away from us. You know, like we were, yeah. you know, as much as, uh, you know, other things come and go, but those, those moments, and I know he even was like, yeah, I might not even, you know, him, you know, him and Laird were their toe partners. And I, so I might not even speak to Laird for five, like a couple of years, but we can speak instantly and, and just that connection of what we did. Yeah. And how heavy those stories were, and the, how crazy it was, and how good it was is just—it's instant, you know. And yeah, and I think that's that's that that's super cool, and and uh, yeah, what a what, what an amazing time. But uh, and, and you know, I, I wanted to get back to you too because when when was you you guys you and Laird went and pa- paddled the English Channel, right? That's a pretty cool story. I remember you guys just put a credit card in your pocket and had this tiny little car or something like take us through that when was that is that pre is that when you you and Laird are hanging out pre 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 the um the pre zodiac toe. and that yeah. yeah that was 1990 and uh Laird was a competitive uh speed sailor windsurfer and he was going to Tarifa for the uh speed trials and then there were some longboard events in in France and stuff so he said well let's go to Europe and and uh, at that time, Laird and I were living together in our shack on Maui. And uh, I said, uh, if we're going to to Europe, let's go, let's paddle the English Channel. So we, we went, we rented our little car, we drove up there and we got the chart and studied it and got a little hotel room, you know, on the thing. And Sylvain was supposed to show up in the morning, take pictures of us before we left. Uh, he didn't get there and we we're sitting in the car going, well, we're going. We got excited. We had our little fanny packs, water, chocolate bar, credit card. You know, that was it. We just launched into the channel and started going. Didn't take long. There was a giant jellyfish I was trying to dodge. And then 20 minutes in, a freighter was coming at us. And it was like, oh, my God, turn around and paddle back. We turn around and paddle back. But the thing turned like now it's still at us. So we turn around and paddle the, towards England. And we just had to keep our line and go. And the thing passed underneath us. And once we got to the mid channel, I mean, the current was super strong. We got to mid channel and a boat came out and said, we're, we're sent out from the coast guard to pick you guys up. It was a Dover rotary club lifesaver boat. We're here to pick you up. And, and Larry and I sat up on our boards and went, no, we came from Hawaii to paddle the channel and we're halfway across. We're paddling. We paddled apart. You're going to get us. You got to get us. And we paddled apart and kept paddling. So they radioed back, got permission to escort us the second half. And uh, we arrived uh, at, yeah, after like five hours there. 
Laird got ahead of me. I was getting hypothermic and my, I was getting slowed down. So Laird ended up beating me by 20 minutes, but I just, the guys were next to me escorting us to the final bit. And they're like, you know, you can give up, you can give up. I'm like, no, I see the land. I'm not giving up. My head down, I could barely paddle. He took us to the hospital and I was hypothermic with the core temperature at 88 degrees. So I, I didn't know much about hypothermia, but your body just shuts down. So yeah, just, uh, but I wasn't going to give up. I was, there it is. I'm getting there. We made it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was it like? What, you know, who, what was it like in those days? You guys just seemed like you just were just, you had a lot of time on your hands to come up with these crazy adventures. <laughs> Well, we're in Europe. Let's let's go do that. And then after that one, Laird's all, well, you know what? I was at Corsica in the Mediterranean. And I think we should go there and paddle over to Elba, paddle over to Italy. So that became our next mission. And in between, we were surfing in France. We did some longboard contests and cruised around and surf. And then we we trained on our paddle boards, paddling up and down the coast. And then uh, we went to Corsica and paddled over to Elba. How far was that one that, um, from Corsica to Italy? Uh, farther than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> we had, we had the, the charts, right? And it said 37. We're like, well, we're in Europe. So that's 37 kilometers. That's only 24 miles. It was, and after we did it, we realized, we, f we found out that it was 37 nautical miles. Nautical like miles. 44 statute miles. Wow. So it took it took us uh, eight eight hours. We arrived at dark. Classic. Just winging it. <laughs> yeah, winging it. Yeah, I did. A, uh, I did one. There was a paddleboard race from San Sebastian into Capriton. They did it a few years, and it was the same thing. I remember seeing it, and they said 30, 34 miles, and I was like, "Ah, it's not so bad." You know, it's the same as Molokai. Yeah, yep. not not much, and there was you know thirty four nautical miles, and uh, so the same yeah. the same thing. And yeah, the, it's funny paddling over there. It feels the ocean feels sort of dead, and, you know, yeah. especially after paddling in Hawaii, right? Yeah. There's, there's always something moving, and the ocean feels yeah. energy. But you know, paddling up that coastline, that you don't see any fish, you don't see dolphins. Like you like, it feels like you're paddling in a swimming pool. Nearly, it just it was really um, really interesting paddling in in Europe in the ocean. Did that was that was when you were paddling is that because i know you you became um really competitive in the in the molokai to wahoo race you, you always you did teams um with that, that dave daly is your partner right no no i never went with dave, dave daly i went i've teamed it with uh kalama and quite a few different guys oh, that's right you, you guys did the yeah the, the stock so 1990 before we went to europe we we had paddled the molokai channel and we just got dropped off. Uh, my friend Hans Hiedemann had a, a little unit over there. We went and stayed with Hans. He dropped us off at, at uh, six in the morning. And Laird and I, with no e or you know a compass, we jumped in and, and paddled the Molokai Channel on a, on a probably 15 to 20 knot wind day. Yep. And, and, and so that was, we did that. And then we went and did Europe after that, but it was, Five, five years after we did that, that they decided to start the Molokai race. And then, so I was in that from the very first one. Yeah. And, uh, probably t up till now, I've done it 14 times in different solo and teams. Yeah, done it with your son as well. That was cool. Yeah, teamed it with my son. Yeah, wow. And then... But I've got a quick, night... I've got a quick Jamie Mitchell story I got to throw out there. I was, oh, you know, <laughs> I was doing a lot of the racing you know, we had, we had Hawaii Kai races and Klein Man, all these different races. And I was in, uh, I was on unlimited boards at that time. So I was usually competing for the top three, you know, three or four spots, always, you know, right in the, in the top. And I was on that unlimited board and I looked in as we were approaching Diamond Head and I saw this guy knee paddling and he passed me. And on a stock board. I go, who is that on a stock board? They go, it's this guy, Jamie Mitchell. I go, Jamie Mitchell, who is that? He just he came around the corner. I kept, I caught a wave as we came in toward the outrigger and I tried to catch you all I had. You beat me on a stock board. And I was just, I was so <laughs> mad. I was like, no stock board ever beat me. Yeah. Who is that guy? Who is that guy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wasn't too popular um, when I started coming over. <laughs> 
Yeah, that was probably the, one of the Duke races, I imagine. Um, from I think one year, I, if it, I, remember, I remember that year, it was, I think I nearly finished, I think Brendan and, you know, Brendan and Guy Perry always sort of oh, battled always up the there, yeah. Yeah. for a little bit. I think those two guys, and Dawson Jones, yeah. they, was, they, they may have... Yeah, I think I may have finished like third or fourth overall in the whole race yeah. on the on the stock board, and uh, yeah, that was uh, they were good times, man. That, that I mean that you know, good time for me you. Up. It wasn't a good time for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, what a great! I mean, paddling. That's the one thing I did learn um, with the big wave surfers and people over here was when I'd come here in the summer. You know, summer's flat in Hawaii, especially on the North Shore, and you got all these people that. Are, you know, surf big waves and, or they just surf this and that and, and all of a sudden they got nothing to do and they got all this energy and uh, all this testosterone and, and so, you know, a lot, a lot of them would train on the paddle boards and they'd do all these paddle board races and they'd be in great shape and when, you know, time comes like now, when October comes around and the surf comes, everyone's in great shape and, and I really appreciate that, you know, because I, I really felt that, like in Australia, it's a little different, like with the uh, the surf life saving and the surfers, there's a bit of a, a there was a, 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 been a, a divide and a rift. It's not cool to be paddling and this and that. So for uh, for me to come to Hawaii and, and I would say be a, a little bit more respected than than Australia was like, wow, this is really cool. You know, you got, I know that guy, that guy's, you know, Buzzy Kerbox, that guy's Charlie Walker and... You know these these guys I have heard about, and they're all doing these races that that I'm doing, and uh, it was just really cool knowing that you're sort of you're like, well, you know what? Maybe I'm on the right path here. Maybe I'm uh, doing that. So that, that that was really cool. But I wanted to talk to you too, Buzz, because I know you um have got a real passion about photography, and I and I see your book in the background there. Why don't you take us through um you know how you got into your photography, and 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 now you've uh, just published a really cool book. Well, I was always into photography. I think I had my first camera when I was like nine years old, the Polaroid Swinger, 1995. I remember the ad for it. And uh, I just always loved it, and I took pictures. So when I started uh, on the tour, I was always taking pictures. I always had my camera, taking background shots. I loved to get behind the scenes and, and some of the action. I didn't have big lenses, so I wasn't getting the, the great surf stuff. Uh, particularly, but I was getting a lot of background stuff. And, you know, just at the time, no one else was taking pictures. Like, you know, just no, nobody had cameras and very, very few were taking pictures. And I just always loved it and always took a lot. And then when I started modeling on the on the modeling shoots, I, I'd be the only guy taking pictures behind the scenes. I'd get the photographer from behind and all, all these angles. And, and uh, when I was in college, I had a writing class and he told me to keep a journal. So I started keeping my journal. And then when I was on the tour and modeling, I kept my journal. And every day I'd write something. And if I was traveling, I'd clip in a postcard or, you know, a concert ticket or whatever we're doing. So I kept these journals. And, and that's, you know, it's like in the back of my mind, someday I'd, I'd like to write a book. So I kept talking about it. And then uh, my wife, now Barbara, is all, you keep talking about a book, so why don't you just do it? get it together. And I was like, that's one thing to think of. Yeah, I want to do it, but actually get out all the photos, a journal, start going through it and make a cohesive book out of it was, was a big project. And it ended up being a lot bigger project than I expected, but, uh, we did it really well. Every page has like pictures and, and text, and it, it's more like a journal and, uh, than just a, a regular book, but it, it's my, I just tell my story from starting surfing at Kailua shore break and, and on a long board and then the short board revolution and the pro surfing and toe surfing and foiling and stand up and just my story as it weaves through the evolution of all these sports. Yeah, that's cool. Cause there is one thing that you, I mean, you have been, you know, your, your career from start to finish, you know, you, you've seen it all and, you know, even with now, like with your with your sons, like with Cody, you know, he was racing on stand up and you know on the stand up tour, and I know you've judged been involved in that as well. So you've got a really vast array of knowledge from from start, you know, from the from the pro tour to then the big waves, and then back to stand up paddling and, and all that stuff. So it's um there must be um yeah amazing to be able to 
to go back and, and have all that stuff. Because I used to journal as well and I, I stopped doing it because I did it so much I sort of was over it. But, you know, when you are able to go back and look at a certain year and, and, and look at what you did and uh, on certain moments, it's it's really, really is an um, amazing thing to do is to, is, is to journal. I mean, you can think back, but you're, you're not really remembering exactly what you were thinking at that time. So by having a journal, I can... I can put myself back in, in that time and, and then other memories come back. Oh, yeah, and this happened and that happened. So by keeping that, that journal, it really uh, gives me an accurate account of what happened and what I was thinking as all these things were evolving. Yeah, that's awesome. So where, 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 can, everyone, where can everyone find a book or buy a book? Well, I was planning this, this big book tour. I bought a motorhome and I was going this summer from, in California from San Francisco to San Diego. And then uh, the COVID hit and canceled the tour. And uh, so right now, the only place you can get it is from my website, which is from me directly. And uh, I, I sign them and, send, and mail them out to, to people. So it's cool. buzzykerbox.com. And you can buy the book and I'll sign it and whoever you want signed to and get it right out to you. Well, all the listeners, that's a good deal. If I did <laughs> sign a book, we're going to buy a book. Uh, I want to get your take before we go, um, just on the on big wave surfing where we stand right now. You know, obviously it's we've you know been um, it's more t- geared towards uh, pa- you know paddling, uh, but you know obviously there's days that you know that tow and stuff like that. But what's your take on it? what's your take on it? What what how what do you think about it? Who who impresses you these days? And uh, you know when you get when you get to see it, you know what's what's your take on big wave surfing in 2020? Well, I've watched a lot of the big wave events uh, from Nazare to Porto to all, all the different ones. But the ones uh, they've been having at PI have been pretty amazing. Some of the ones you were in. And uh, there's there's a, a core group of guys that are charging big waves, paddling in like uh, there's no tomorrow. And uh, it's they've uh, really pushed the limit. There's a lot of there's a lot of guys that are doing it, but then there's probably five or eight that are really, you know, successfully riding giant waves. And yeah. I think, you know, yeah, it's uh, like guys, like, I think if you look, really look at Jaws, I mean, to be guys, honest, if you're being honest with everyone, you know, you've got, you got to look at, you know, what Billy's done, you know, Kemper, what, Albie's, what Albie's doing, Albie. what Kai's doing, you know, Paige, Paige, what Paige is doing on the, on the, on the women's side. Shane Dorian. Uh, yeah. What Dorian used to do. Twiggy. And, and, yeah, Twiggy, and even uh, like Tyler, like a local, like Tyler Laurent. Tyler Laurent, yeah. There's just some really, there's some really, really, yeah, you know, working with Sean, you know, those guys there with the getting the shorter boards and, you know, where Albie sits compared to where Billy sits and Ian, Ian Walsh as well. I mean, just, there's some amazing, talented, like just general surfers that have brought that to, to big wave surfing. And, and it, it, it's awesome, you know, because, uh, it's awesome to watch those guys. It's inspiring to see the yeah. lines they draw and and uh, you know the wave selection that they have and uh, yeah and you know obviously there's other you know you know I like, I like Lucas lot- Chumbo's um, at, uh, backhand <coughs> you know on his backhand I think he's probably the best guy on his backhand out there. Makua, the there's there's a bunch. Makua, there's- yeah, there's a lot of a lot of good but guys. But my hats off to these guys. These are these guys are paddling into giant waves and and uh, riding the barrel and taking it apart. And it's uh, uh, I don't really want to paddle into big ones out there. It's a it's a different thing, you know. Towing in is obviously a lot easier to position and get them. But uh, hats off to these guys. They've taken it to another level. I think a, a prog- progression. It kind of seems like it took toe surfing to get to another level. And then these guys have taken it from that level to another level of paddling. Yeah. But, so, but it certainly helps when you're paddling, when you have flotation, inflation and jet ski standing by. Uh, it's a big, big difference from just paddling out by yourself and being out there. But these yeah. guys, with all with all the safety gear that they have now, they're taking it. They're taking it to the edge. There's no it doesn't make it easier. It makes it a little safer, but certainly not easier. What what do you what do you guys think if you know would your your guys approach being different if you had that from the start you know all the jet skis in the side looking after you guys and 
and the pool flotation vest, this and that, you know, I mean, I mean, what you guys did was, in, I mean, more, in my opinion, what you guys were doing were more, was more scary than what we're doing because, you, you know, just having that no flotation and the, and the smaller jet skis and just no, no one specifically looking out for, you know, Buzzy, if he falls, you, your tow partner's going in to get you on these tiny jet skis. So for me, it seems like gnarly or what you guys did, you know, because of just the, you, you guys were, were starting it, you know? Well, it's all gnarly still what they're doing now, what like the yeah. waves that you are taking off on. I mean, you guys, you guys are just pushing the limit and paddling in and riding. That's uh, hats off to, to where it is. But uh, I, I'm kind of glad that I don't have to ride them that giant anymore, you know? <laughs> but I, what, I sure what love is your, what, it, what is your limit? I, I remember we, we ran into each other last year <laughs> around Chris, no, New Year's. Was it New Year's? I think. <clears throat> Yeah, it was just around New Year's and we had a decent swell. We ran into each other. You were having um, dinner at uh, Haliba Joe's with... Uh, oh, right, uh, right. Yeah, and uh, you, you just you just had a toe session, I think, with your buddy from Maui yeah. who flew over and uh, and you were... Philip, your butt, Philip, you, yeah. You, yeah, you guys were stoked. You know, you had a great session. And so, where you know, is that... Are you still... You're still searching. You still got your ski. You're still out there. You know, on, when the conditions are right, the swell's right, Buzzy's still out there getting his fix. It's just not the next level. It's like not that, six, you know? yeah, yeah. It's not sixty foot jaws anymore. Smaller yeah. stuff, and I still, I still love the toe in technique. Like, like I said before, I, I like the riding part. To me, you know, riding on, on waves and taking off and having the full down the line and being able to perform. Um, that that's my favorite part. It, it, big, bigger giant waves usually aren't as walled up or something. You get the bigger one, you kind of have to outrun it a little bit more. So, I mean, still, I still, I'm probably up to like 30 foot faces. I'm happy now. After that, I'm kind of, maybe I don't yeah. need that one. Yeah. Well, hey, that's fine. Yeah. You got you to keep, you gotta keep riding your bike with the dog along the bike path. You yeah. don't want to blow a knee out or blow a yeah. shoulder or do anything like that. So, yeah. All right. Well, um, I got. I usually I, I finish off with five questions, uh, you know, to the guys that are surfing. But I, I'd like to get your opinion on these two. Um, so we've got five. Okay. I call it five to finish. Okay. And um, the first question is, and I'm pretty sure I know what your answer is. The best big wave in the world. Uh, undoubtedly, I think PI is the best big wave in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the scariest big wave in the world. You know, I haven't been out at Chopu, Big Chopu. I've surfed it on smaller days, but um, Chopu is thick and gnarly and on the reef and intense mm -hmm. and seems more dangerous of slamming the reef and getting hurt like that. But then, you know, big waves at Piahi are more about the hold down. I, I asked that question to Kai Laney and he said his, uh, the, the worst beatings he ever got were at Piahi compared yeah. to Mavericks and every, everywhere he's been, that was, you took the worst beatings out there. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. I think, uh, yeah, I, th I look at Nathan Fletcher's wave that he took that, that toe wave and I'm like, I falling in that thing looks just like yeah. apocal apocalyptic. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Question number three. Uh, if the most, uh, underrated big wave in the world, that I'm not sure. I think there's some spots out there that, uh, you know, probably even some guys are keeping secret, but there's, mm. there's some big waves around the world places. And I've seen stuff from Ireland. Uh, so mm. I, I don't really know. I've just, I stay here and focus on the waves here. So that's, yeah. I, I, I have a hard time answering that accurately. Yeah. Okay. So I want to put you back into your prime of your life. Uh, if 80, you're in your prime, probably 1980. If you're, if you're in your prime and, and you, what big wave um, would you like to have surfed that you that you didn't get a chance to? Probably, you know, pretty big chopu. I, I would have loved to have ridden that. That looks like when you get the right ones. I mean, there's the barrels those guys are getting out there. There's there's no other wave like that in the world. And yeah, that, the, inten I mean, the intensity of being locked in that and then getting fire hosed out into the yeah, channel there's there's, yeah, there's not much better feeling than that i imagine yeah that yeah. that looks like the ultimate yeah cool but, and then the last one is where do you think the next 
big wave discovery that's going to blow people's mind is? I'm not telling. I'm <laughs> going there. <laughs> good, good answer. Good answer. Don't tell. No, I, I don't know. I, 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 like I said, I, I stay here and I think pretty yeah. much all the big waves in Hawaii have been discovered. Unless we get some big freak swell with a certain direction that's, that breaks someplace that doesn't usually break. Yeah, and that's a once in a generational thing anyway. Yeah. So, but um, well, cool, Buzzy. That was awesome. I had a great time chatting with you. And again, like I said, thank you for um, yeah, paving the way and being a part of that and uh, all that you've done for big wave surfing. And um, I'm I'm sure that a lot of kids that are on the way up that you know might have known who who you were. Hopefully, they get a chance to understand the part of, part in the big wave surfing history that you have the huge part. So thanks very much, mate. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for having me on your show. Appreciate it. All right. We'll see you in the water. All right.